So um, that was that was really interesting. I, I I learned quite a lot there. That was fantastic. Um, so our next speaker is Peter Hughes. Peter is the head of cloud at Push Technologies. So uh, Peter's going to talk to us about lessons learned building event driven real time web and mobile applications. So welcome, Peter. Hi there. Welcome. Good to be here. Okay. Oh. Um, Sorry, off you go, Peter. Great, thanks. Um, so, uh, yes, real-time uh, event-driven applications um, and web and mobile in particular are a really interesting uh, category of, of applications that um, we've been looking at at the company I'm, I'm working for, Push Technology, precisely because a lot of the traditional um, architectures and uh, tools built for event streaming and event driven applications have historically not really um, been designed for the realities of the internet. Um, as we're seeing, and I think Hugo uh, just did a great job of, of talking around the new um, standards and, and specifications for providing sort of event driven communication um, over the internet, there's a pretty clear divide between the maturity of, let's say, the traditional request response or RESTful um, communication styles and what more real-time oriented applications really need when they're going over um, the internet, which is at best a fairly unpredictable um, and at worst uh, utterly horrible um, network uh, to deal with. So to kind of give a bit of background, um, the company I'm, I'm at, Push Technology, we've been providing a sort of internet facing um, event broker um, middleware for a variety of different companies over the past decade or so. And in that time, we've been able to get quite close firsthand experience of the kind of challenges that all these different companies um, are, are facing when trying to build new real-time experiences. Um, and so what I want to do today is sort of cover some of those high-level challenges and really identify a few key problems that, that seem to occur time and time again and, and sort of dive into what at least we think are, are some of the best ways to, to resolve those challenges. So to kind of start off then, um, if we're building a event driven application that's trying to provide some form of real time experience, we obviously care about delivery. We, we need these events to be delivered with relatively low latency. But because we're talking about web and mobile apps, these aren't necessarily internal um, services where there's maybe hundreds to thousands of internal users. We could be talking about applications that need to handle millions of concurrent connections, um, billions or, or trillions of events, which is a level of scalability that we need to, to account for even when we're building our, our architecture for even smaller scales, simply because of the speed at which things can grow. Now, because of that scale, we also really need to be aware of bandwidth and, and efficiency there. I'm sure many people watching this talk are aware of the uh, egress costs that many uh, cloud providers have. And this is something that can really bite um, organizations who are used to developing and operating event-driven architectures inside a data center or inside a, a particular um, network environment where transmission costs of data might be relatively low. As you start scaling that up over the public internet, that cost can become increasingly high. And it's also worth remembering too, that that cost isn't just something that you as the developer or organization have to deal with. Customers too, especially in developing nations, often are very sensitive to data limits, uh, data cost. So being efficient there can become absolutely necessary for actually 
releasing and, and, and making available applications. And then from a development side, um, time to market, maintenance, all of that can become really tricky to deal with, especially with an event-driven type application where the maturity of tools aren't necessarily there compared to other established forms of, of communication. Um, again, like Hugo was talking about with open API, there's a clear need for standardization around things like pub sub um, streaming interactions. So these are some of the requirements that, that, that we see. And to try and take that down into sort of the capabilities that keep coming up um, around all of these. Um, the first key challenge, quite perhaps self-evidently, is event streaming. We need a solution that can handle streaming real-time events in a way that is designed for the internet. Secondly, and this is something that we've seen in quite a lot of different types of applications and companies, is a need for data wrangling. Um, the ability to organize and enrich data so allow specific access. And we'll get into that in a little more detail. And, and finally, it comes to the surprise, fine-grained security, um, the ability to establish access to specific parts of data. And if we're dealing, say, in a PubSub model, per topic permissions is absolutely critical. And I will cover a little bit about why existing modes of security aren't necessarily um, the most appropriate. So to kind of go through this uh, very quickly uh, and, and explain what we really mean. So event streaming is really when our application is reacting to changes in state. Something happened. And when we say that something happened, we're really talking about state and time. So when we're talking about event streaming, we're talking about stateful data that's attached to something happening in time. And in the vast majority of cases, especially when we're thinking about consumer facing applications, the faster you can deliver events, the quicker each application can do something useful. Um, if you think about a stock trading app, you need the buy and sell prices of each stock to be updated in a reasonable time frame. Um, if you have an application that is trying to do some form of alerting or messaging, no one's going to use it if it takes forever for particular messages and events to be sent from one user to another. So the time component really becomes a question of delivery, of being able to transmit data over the network. And state becomes a question of precisely what you're transmitting. And that's where we get into data wrangling. Um, of all of the organizations that I've worked quite closely with, um, their internal architectures involve a variety of different backend data sources. Um, it's really not uncommon to see uh, some form of pub sub through, let's say, Redis, um, a static data store that might be Postgres, various internal or external REST APIs. All of these carry some important part of the overall data model that the application needs to reference. And data wrangling is the act of taking these sources of data and then remapping, restructuring, filtering, or expanding all of these to make it more easily accessible for downstream consumers, the actual applications that need to present that data to the user. And finally, um, just to briefly touch on security, we're used to having an enormous amount of control over the security and connections between our backend components. Um, but what we really need to worry about, obviously, for any kind of user-facing application is that last mile, the edge that you don't control, um, where we expose this critical business information and data out over a public interface. Now for RESTful APIs, there's a very well-established um, tools for, for doing just that. Um, but when we look at the event streaming side, the maturity becomes a little more difficult. 
you certainly wouldn't, for instance, want to expose a Kafka cluster over a public network interface. Um, so having a method of delivering data that is not just sending messages over, let's say, a WebSocket, but also being able to correctly identify, authenticate, and authorize access of those consumers in a way that's scalable and works with the rest of your backend data sources is really, really vital here. So just to kind of tie all this together really quick, when we're looking at, let's say, to start with data wrangling, we're talking about how we can specialize data for consumers, which is ultimately what we're doing when we're streaming events. Now, because we're streaming events in a continuous manner, this isn't a request response type interaction, we really need to think about fine-grained security at an event level and in a way that can operate continuously. And of course, if we need to apply security at a granular level, then that takes us back to the data wrangling of being able to expand that data that we have in a way that our security model can be correctly applied to it. So let's get into um, just a little bit about how Diffusion, the, the platform that we've built to provide all of these sort of capabilities, has actually helped in some real applications. Um, so to start with, let's take a quite common pattern where a, an organization may have an internal data source, let's say Kafka or something similar, where there's an enormously high amount of events, but a relatively low number of topics. We're pushing, let's say, orders through one topic where messages are keyed based on a user ID. Now, we can't just expose that to any downstream application because, of course, our security model needs to allow only a particular user to see the topics and messages that are specific to them. So using a event broker that's capable of breaking up a large coarse grain topic into multiple separate channels for events allows us to apply security at a much more granular level, which allows our downstream user-facing applications to subscribe to the specific event channels that they need. There's another aspect here too, which is important to consider. Unlike a request response model, security in an event streaming world needs to account for the fact that we're dealing with long-lived connections. We're talking about web sockets. They're established once, and everything after that just goes down the same connection, which means that we need to have a system that's handling those web sockets that knows who each user is that knows the identity associated with each connection and is able to update or continuously evaluate any permission or access model that might be needed. Um, this is something that you find in some GraphQL implementations, for instance, um, but it's not necessarily taken for granted. Um, I think as we develop as an industry, uh, better defined standards for things like pub sub communication, the security angle is going to become increasingly important to define because right now there's very little in the way of standardization. But every customer that, that I've worked with has identified this as a key requirement. We need to make sure that access from an event streaming perspective is secure. And a great example of this would be, let's say, uh, uh, a sports data company we have, um, they collect telemetry from players on, let's say, a football field. And they're publishing all of this to their internal systems as one large aggregate array. Um, this is just example data here. Obviously, the, the real data is much, much larger. Being able to expand that and allow access to individual topics is something that applies at both you know, a security basis, but also from a general application perspective, when you're splitting up topics to allow for granular permissioning, 
You're also splitting up topics to allow for more efficient access to data. Applications only need to stream events that are specific to what they need to display. So the second uh, operation or idea around wrangling and, and event-driven applications is how event wrangling can really help with quicker iteration and dev time. Um, it's not uncommon for organizations that have an established internal event source to have that kind of siloed off from the development teams working on end user applications. And while that obviously is a necessary um, separation from a data integrity perspective, it can make it really difficult for front end teams to quickly try out new ideas or to add features in a way that isn't based entirely on the schedule of a separate team. So having something in the middle, something that can act as a kind of self-serve um, tool for, for front-end teams to model data in a way that makes sense for their features, but that still ultimately relies on that upstream event source as the source of truth, lets development teams start trialing out features much quicker. It gives them more autonomy, and that means quicker time to market, quicker validation of applications. A great example of how that uh, can be used is another reference, or another customer of ours. They have a securities trading application. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about Redis and Postgres and internal APIs. They have all of these as their data sources. And then using wrangling are able to very easily mix and match different parts of this data model together and present that as a single stream for down, downstream event consumers, like their mobile app or the web app. And of course, depending on whether it's web or mobile, they may have slightly different views with more or less data as part of that. I think this also speaks to why things like GraphQL are becoming an increasingly popular paradigm for data access, precisely because this autonomy of front-end development allows for much quicker, uh, you know, development and then releasing of features. So the third and final thing uh, I want to talk about today is the delivery. Like I said earlier, event streaming is about moving state through time. And in order to make the most value out of events, we need to be cognizant of what we're sending and, and how we're sending it. So the best way or one, one common um, thing that we often see is customers trying to send a lot of data over the network and then using their front end applications to sort of sort out their data and discarding a bunch and only using what the application needs. But that really doesn't scale particularly well, um, especially in the context of internet facing applications it's those user-facing apps that have a relatively unpredictable um, scaling pattern. You can't tell if you're going to hit the front news of front page of Hacker News and suddenly have ten times as many users as you did the day before. What you can do, however, is predict the scale on your back end and the event brokers in the systems that are actually handling and distributing these events. So using transformation capabilities at that stage of doing expensive operations once on the source data and then making that available for consumers to pick and choose from rather than doing everything on a per consumer basis allows you to optimize the, the scalability of that transformation augmentation. And if you do that at that stage, you also get the ability to start controlling things like how much data is actually being sent. And that's really important because the only way to reduce latency of the internet is really to send less data. You can't upgrade all of your users' mobile plans. You can't buy everyone a better internet connection. Sending less data is the only way you have to really drive down latency and thus improve throughput, performance, the overall real-time experience. So 
wrangling for efficiency, it's an important aspect of how you can improve your overall application performance. It allows consumers to express exactly what they need. And it's also where things like serialization format can become really important. A lot of APIs may be sending data in plain text, but you really should consider binary formats like protob protocol buffers or CBOR, for instance. So to recap here, um, when we're talking about event streaming, we're talking about what we can do to optimize for delivery. Um, with fine-grained security, we're really talking about how we can handle role-based permissions in a continuous streaming environment. And data wrangling lets us perform easier development of features in web and mobile applications built on top of our event sources. So thank you all for listening. Um, I think we have time for questions. Is there any? Yes, thank thank you, Peter. Um, it's very very insightful. Thank you. Um, so I've got th we've got three questions here from from the audience. Um, so I'll try, try and get to all of them um, just to kind of help manage time. Four minutes, I think. Uh, what roughly a minute per question. So the first is: Do you see Jot Stroke OIDC as a way to propagate identity via event sourcing channels? Um. I didn't quite catch the, the start of that question, I'm sorry. Do you see Java Web Tokens stroke OIDC uh, as a way to propagate identity via event sourcing channels? Uh, yes, in fact, that's what we have seen most organizations adopting. Um, I think Web Tokens as a general concept are fairly independent or agnostic of the underlying delivery channel. So it's really about ensuring that these event brokers on the other side are capable of handing, handling uh, tokens in a way that works uh, within the overall kind of event streaming paradigm. Okay. Um, next question. Uh, what is the best way or method to model all data in event-driven architecture in user-facing applications? <laughs> um, I, I, I think I'll, I'll go to it depends. Um, dep for, for some customers we've seen, um, there's, there's a very clear uh, translation of their type of application data to sort of a very traditional pub sub model um, with a relatively flat topic hierarchy. Um, other applications may be more graph based. So again, things like graph uh, QL um, present a, a way of defining everything as a sort of recursive or, or deep hierarchy of, of, of JSON objects. Um, it, it really does depend on what the precise requirements and type of events are. I think this is kind of a follow-up question. What, what, what database management system, SQL or not, NoSQL, would you consider the best for security and to maximize performance of event-driven APIs? So I think, uh, again, I wouldn't... Uh, be in a position, I think, to, to collect any specific ones. What I would say, though, is that for many traditional event streaming applications or that are built on top of things like Redis or Kafka, the existing um, tools around there really are built under the assumption that you can utilize things like private VPCs um, or much more static type uh, security models. So it, it really comes down to, I think, that there aren't great tools in this space and in industry. Um, I think that's something that I, I really hope to see mature over the next couple of years. Thank you. Well, listen, I think we're, we're right bang on time. So thank you very much, Peter. It's been absolutely fantastic. Um, enjoy the rest of the event. Thank you.